Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is the 14th of 17 episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abala, which had been produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones, but was now edited by John Davis. Davis's standard of copy editing was much lower than Nathaniel Jones's had been, and this fourteenth episode had sloppy punctuation. It was published on the 6th of October, 1859. Episode 14. The Seventh Evening. News of the horrific encounter spread like wildfire through Cedarville. The whole town was agitated. The news that Willie Hammond had been murdered by Green was spread within minutes by many wagging tongues. There were a hundred different versions of the story, each with assorted details of the incident. By the time the two dead bodies were to be transported to Mr Hammond's residence, hundreds of men, women and children gathered outside the pub. Some were clamouring for Green, others were shouting for Judge Lyman, whom many people thought was implicated in the trouble. The sight of the two dead bodies being carried out on boards intensified their anger. I heard many shouting, Bring out the murderer! Some of the crowd formed a solemn procession to escort the bodies, but most stayed outside the pub. Every angry breast was on fire with rage for Green. One ringleader climbed on the shoulders of another and shouted, We mustn't let the murderer escape! The crowd responded with a terrible howl, and it seemed that even the sky was crackling. Choose ten men to search the house and its surroundings, ordered an audacious elder. Yes, yes, pick them, name them, answered the crowd. Ten men were selected by name and came forward at once. Search everywhere, from roof to cellar, everywhere, every one, shouted the aspiring leader. Without hesitation, the ten searched through the house. For nearly a quarter of an hour, the crowd waited with increasing anxiety and displeasure. The investigators finally made their appearance to say that Green could not be found anywhere in the house or its surroundings. This news was received with a great collective sigh. Let no man in Cedarville rest until we find the murderer, the self-appointed leader shouted from his shoulder-high throne. Let us seek out and find the scoundrel. Let everyone with a horse use it to help the investigation and hunt down the culprit, he added. About fifty people left in a hurry. The searchers divided into four parties, each taking a distinct section of the county to explore. The horsemen went to search to the outer parts of the country and the men on foot, the inner parts. As some hours went by, most of the foot searchers returned without any success. Late afternoon, the horsemen also began to reappear, and by sunset, the last of the searchers was back. They were all tired and disappointed, and believed that the murderer had escaped safely. The Black Ryan barroom remained empty for several hours during these overwhelming events. Slade didn't make an appearance until the crowd dispersed. When he appeared on the stairs, he seemed organised and clean-shaven, but I saw signs that he'd spent the previous night without sleep. His eyes were red and heavy, and his eyelids swollen. As he was coming downstairs, I came in from the entrance porch. He looked ashamed, and passed me by, without speaking, only nodding, to acknowledge me. I could see guilt mixing with anxiety and fear on his face. He'd a strong reason to believe he might get into trouble, for he'd been gambling in Green's room when the dreadful act was committed. This is a sad affair, he said, when we came face to face about half an hour later. He wouldn't look me in the eye. Terrible, I replied, to corrupt and impoverish a young man and then kill him. There's no more sinister story on the pages of history. It was an act of madness, said the publican, trying to justify Green. Green didn't intend to kill him. Then why did he carry a knife in peaceful company? He had murder in his heart, sir, I replied. You speak boldly. Nothing is bolder than the facts, I replied. He had murder in his heart from the beginning. His previous actions against Willie Hammond show this beyond dispute. Well, the devil wouldn't want to be in Green's shoes now, said the shaking publican. It's quite clear that the punishment was more terrifying to his eyes 
than the crime itself. Oh, how I hope your intoxicating trade is doomed, I said. My words were so unpleasant for Slade that he made a quick excuse to leave. As it got late, the unsuccessful gambler prosecutors began to congregate one by one, and within an hour the bar room was overflowing with members of the disappointed mob. They were weary, and emitting the most offensive oaths because they hadn't apprehended the culprit. They were all convinced that Green had managed to escape, and the stronger that conviction, the greater their anger. They all knew that Green, Hammond, Judge Lyman and Simon Slade were all in the room where the deed was done. As the mob had lost their prey, they were thirsting to take revenge on someone. "'Where's Slade?' shouted one from the middle of the barroom. "'Why does he hide away?' "'Yes, where is he?' called out half a dozen others. "'Is he out looking for Green?' one asked. "'No, no, we don't believe he's doing that,' said at least fifty. "'Yet the murder took place in his own house before his own eyes.' "'Yes, he was there, and he let it happen,' several shouted with indignation. "'Where is Slade? Has anyone seen him tonight? "'Matthew, where's Simon Slade?' "'I don't think he's at home,' replied the barkeeper. "'He looked hesitant and intimidated. "'When did you last see him?' About two hours ago. Liar! one shouted furiously. Who says it's a lie? said Matthew, seeming to get angry. I do, said a strong, cruel-looking man, who rushed across the room to tower over him. What right do you have to say that? asked Matthew, backing off. Because you are a liar, said the man. You saw him less than half an hour ago, and you know it well. Now, if you don't want trouble, tell the truth. The crowd yelled out again, Where's Slade? I don't know, said Matthew, looking determined. Is he in the house? He might be with the devil for all I know, but he's not in the house, said Matthew. I know nothing more about him than you. Will you help look for him? Matthew went to the door and shouted for Frank. What's all this about? Frank shouted downstairs. His voice sounded fearful. Is your father in the house? I don't know, was his non-committal reply. Send someone to bring Frank down to the bar room and we'll soon see if he's telling the truth, someone said. Two men slipped down to the bar, heading towards the room from where Frank's voice had come. They soon returned, gripping his arms and dragging him like a naughty child into the bar room. He looked white and ashen and was clearly not enjoying this unwelcome assault on his freedom. "'There you are, boy,' said one as Frank was brought in. "'We don't want to have to mess with anyone, "'so we advise you to answer our questions and tell the truth. "'Now where's your father?' "'I think he's around the house somewhere,' Frank said, "'sounding more humble in the face of the angry crowd. "'When did you last see him?' "'Not very long ago. Ten minutes?' "'No, more like half an hour. "'Where was he then?' "'He was going upstairs.' Go and tell him it would be better for him if he came down here at once. Frank left the room, but came back about five minutes later, saying he couldn't find his father. Where's he gone? The crowd cried out in anguish. Indeed, gentlemen, I do not know, Frank said, his frightened look suggesting he was telling the truth. There's something wrong here, said one. Why isn't Slade here? Why won't he help catch the murderer, who he saw with his own eyes? Perhaps he's helping the murderer escape, said another, without so much as a single fact to substantiate his accusation. There's no doubting that, said another, as reckless as the first. This was enough to stir up the mob's uncontrollable fury, in the manner of those who are always too hasty in their decisions, and rush on their way without seeking adequate facts or heeding the voice of reason. Where is he? Where is he? Yes, Slade knows where Green is, they shouted. Two or three men were chosen to search the house, and several others went out to undertake a wider search outside. I left the bar to go to my room. I felt overwrought and tired. I wanted to lie down and try to sleep. I lit a candle, went upstairs to my room, and locked the door. As I was about to lie down, I heard creeping footsteps moving back and forth along the passageways, and doors opening and closing. Then I thought I heard someone breathing in my room. I sat up, but decided it was only my own pumping heart, not anything external to me. It's only imagination, I told myself. But I continued to sit up and listen, until I satisfied myself 
that it was imaginings. I lay down again, hoping to get to sleep, but before I could, once again I thought I heard the sound of someone moving in my room. It's just your imagination, I said to myself again, expecting that someone was passing the door. Your mind is agitated. I lifted my head and cut my ear with my hand and listened. I focused my attention on my room without listening to the other distant noises. I was about to drop my head back on the pillow when I heard something so clearly that I couldn't mistake it. It was a faint cough, and it came from under the bed. I jumped up, squatted down, and looked under the bed. The mystery was discovered. I could see a pair of fiery eyes glistening in the light of the candle. Green was hiding under my bed. I looked at him for a few moments, unable to say a word. He stared back at me furiously and boldly, and then I saw he was clawing for his pistol. That's the end of the fourteenth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abala on the 6th of October, 1859. Once again, this episode was signed with the name Glasslewin, the bardic name of Daniel Owen. I'm Robert Lomas, and I spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.